Hi, I'm Alex Sudris, and welcome to our Bold Method Live VFR presentation tonight, where we're talking about pressure and density altitude. Normally, these are things that we kind of think about a little bit more when the weather is getting warmer, especially as we get into summer, which should be kind of happening around now. But as you can see, I'm back in the sweater because it's snowing in Boulder, Colorado tonight. But hopefully, that warmer weather is right around the corner. Either way, pressure and density altitude always affect your aircraft's performance, winter to summer. The aircraft, it really doesn't care what time of year it is, and so it's always a factor. And tonight, we're not gonna just talk about pressure altitude and density altitude, we're gonna talk about why changing air energy and pressure changes air density. And by the end of this, you should be able to describe how as a pressure system moves through, and your altimeter will change. And if you grab the Colesman knob, and you adjust that altimeter setting, you'll be able to explain where the altimeter will move and why. Basically, you're gonna cover all of the theory behind pressure altitude and density altitude, and this is something that can confuse anybody from a CFI all the way down to a student. So tonight, we've got Colin Cutler as our technical director. He'll be bringing in questions. We have Swain Martin working the chat. So if there's things that you want us to go into more detail on, or if you've got a question that pops up, throw that out there in the chat, Swain will forward over to Colin Cutler, and then he'll bring it up live on the screen. Okay, so with that, let's talk about what this all boils down to, and that is air density. Your airplane doesn't care what altitude it's at, and it doesn't care what the temperature is. It just cares about the air density, how dense that air is. That affects your wing's ability to generate lift. It affects the resulting drag. It affects your engine's ability to produce thrust and power, and it doesn't make a difference whether you're a jet or a turboprop or a reciprocating airplane. It doesn't make a difference if you're turbocharged or normally aspirated. Air density affects all of those. In fact, the only thing it really doesn't affect at all is weight. And so that's why it's such an important factor when we come down to performance. It's all about air density. Okay, so how do we get there? Let's take a look at the iPad. This is a density equation. And we've taken out the Greek parts and, and replaced it with words, but it's very simple when you look at it. Density is affected by pressure and it's affected by temperature and R right here. So let's explain what those are. Normally, pressure, when you're computing it, would be measured in pascals, but it could be inches of mercury. And you can see it's on top of the equation. So as pressure starts to move up, density is going to go up. Okay, if we take a look at the bottom, that's where we have our temperature. And here, this is temperature in absolute Kelvin. So it's basically starting at zero and going up. And if we look at that, it's inversely proportional to density. So as we start to raise temperature, density is going to go down. Simple enough. Okay, and the last thing that we've got here is R. R is a constant. It's a constant that depends on the gas. Every gas has its own constant, and that equation works for air, or argon, or tire pressure, or nitrogen pressure in a, in a jet's tires. It, it's just a gas law. And so dry air has an R value, and as you start to add humidity to air, it has a different constant value. And if we go back to that equation, if you take a look at the R, as you start to add humidity, R starts low, Okay, so for the sake of it, we'll say maybe dry would be one. It's not one, but we'll just start there. As you add humidity, it starts to go up. So you can see that as we add humidity to the air, R increases and air density decreases. Okay, so let's take a look at that uh, in a little more practical setting. And then we're gonna go through all of this in detail as we look at different pressure systems and how they're going to affect your airplane. And we'll start with an airplane that's just sitting at the airport. That's kind of our example for the night. The airport's gonna be at sea level, so kind of a fictional airport, and we're gonna watch a pressure system move through and talk about how that changes the air's pressure and density and temperature and how that affects the airplane. So let's jump into the first one here on the iPad. And we're starting at what we call standard temperature, or sorry, standard pressure, and that's 29.92. Um, this isn't an average, okay? People ask, you know, where do they come up with that? Is the temperature, is the pressure normally close to 29.92? No, it's, it's just somewhere in the middle. It's kind of in the, in the mean range, the middle range 
of different pressures. At your airport, uh, sea level pressure could be anywhere from two or three inches higher to maybe three inches below that. So it's, it's not that that's your average daily pressure, it's just kind of a middle number. And that's where we're gonna start today. When we talk about high pressure and low pressure, we're not necessarily talking about specific numbers. We're talking about pressure changing, getting higher or getting lower. That's how we're gonna look at it today. Okay, so let's go back to this. And let's just play this out. So here's a scenario where the pressure is ranging. You can see we have a low pressure moving out of the area over here and a high pressure moving into the area there. And so the station pressure at sea level, that was increasing. It increased from 2992 to 30.41. 30 okay, so let's take a look at that in kind of a profile view and see what's happening with those isobars. So if we take a look at it, you've got your low pressure over here. You've got your high pressure on the left side. We've put the actual station pressure right there at the surface. And you've got an altimeter. In the bottom of the altimeter, you'll see the Colesman setting, 29.92. That's the value that you're gonna pick up and you're gonna send into your airplane once you get your, your ATIS or the local weather observation. But in this case, we're just assuming that the airplane is just sitting there. There's no one in it. So the altimeter, it doesn't know that the pressure is changing. And the altimeter is very much like your airplane. It, it really doesn't know, doesn't know how high you are. It doesn't know, all it does is feel density and pressure. So that's, that's what the altimeter essentially is measuring. It's a big barometer. So as we go into that, remember, you can see this low pressure system is moving out of the area. And notice what's happening. As the pressure at the station rises, our altimeter is unwinding. We know the airport's at sea level, but it's actually showing less than sea level. And as that altimeter setting gets all the way up to 30.42 as this high pressure system moves in, and I'll pause it and rewind just a little bit back there. You can see that the altimeter shows that we're 500 feet lower. It thinks that we're 500 feet below sea level. And that basically comes down to what pressure altitude is. We started at standard pressure, um, but what pressure altitude is, is your actual altitude corrected for non-standard pressure. And that's what we have right now. We started at standard pressure, 2992. We're right at sea level. And then as that pressure started to increase, it wasn't ISA standard pressure anymore. So we correct for that. And now it shows that we're 500 feet below sea level. Okay, so we got a question. Okay, let's hop in here with the first question. This comes from Jack, and he wants to know, uh, with what you just showed, if temperature stays the same, does a change in air pressure affect my aircraft's performance? It absolutely does. And um, give me one second, because we're going to dive into that on the next slide. Um, it absolutely affects your, your, your aircraft's performance. Even if temperature is exactly standard, pressure, um, the sea level pressure will change that. Uh, so one thing I want you to take away from this, if you look at what happened, if we go back to the altimeter here and you see where we started, we started at 29.92, okay? And we've gone to 30.42. And we've seen that we've lost 500 feet. That actually shows you the equation for calculating pressure altitude. I'm gonna write that out at the top. Pressure altitude, you take 29.92, subtract your altimeter setting, so essentially here, 30.42, okay? So that would give us 0.5, negative 0.5. Then you take that negative 0.5 and you multiply that times 1,000. And the reason we multiply it by 1,000 is because around sea level and in the first part of the atmosphere. Essentially, as you climb 1,000 feet, pressure drops one inch. So you start at, let's say, 29.92 at sea level, if that's the actual pressure that day, you go up to 1,000 feet, it's 28.92. You go up another 1,000 feet, it's 27.92. Now, that's not true throughout the entire atmosphere. If you think about it, it's kind of logarithmic. 
the compression of the atmosphere means that as you start to get higher, the, the pressure changes less and less and less. And so your altimeter is not going to be as accurate. But when we're close to sea level, it's about an inch per thousand feet. So that's why we're multiplying our, our number, that negative 0.5, by a thousand feet, because the altimeter setting has changed by a half inch, okay? And we're going to multiply that by a thousand feet. And if we go back to the iPad, you'll see that gives you negative 500. And you would simply take that negative 500 and add that to your station elevation. Um, so today we're at sea level, five, negative 500 plus, plus uh, sea level would get you 500 feet below. And in this case, your altimeter now shows you below. And, and if you've never lived close to sea level, you might ask, you know, can an altimeter do that? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, when we're flying out of the coast in Oregon on a cold day, um, high pressure, absolutely. It'll show that you're actually below sea level, which is kind of, uh, kind of interesting there. So uh, if you were to figure out your pressure altitude. Okay, so let's take a look at the next part. Um, and as we get into that, we asked, does this affect our performance? And I'm going to show you the chart from the Cirrus. So I'm going to switch over to ForeFlight. Um, and here it comes. Okay, so this is just like any airplane's performance data. It doesn't make a difference what you're flying. We're all going to have the same effect by pressure and density. Uh, so when we look at this Cirrus takeoff distance, uh, if you look at the numbers here, you can see it's based off of 3,600 pounds, which is our maximum gross weight. And what are our numbers in? It's in pressure altitude. And as we start to increase pressure altitude, you'll notice our ground roll goes from 1352 to 1443 to 1540. So let's think about this as if we're based at an airport at 1,000 feet. On a standard day with sea level pressure of 29.92, okay, and let's just say we're at zero degrees temperature here to keep this simple. Okay, on a standard day at 29.92 and zero degrees temperature, um, we'll say that our ground roll is 1,443 feet. Okay, so now let's add an inch. So as opposed to 29.92, um, we're 30.92. So once we figure that out, we would actually subtract 1,000 feet from our airport's elevation. So now our pressure altitude is sea level. And at standard pressure and a zero degree day, our ground roll goes down to 1352. So that thousand feet adds, you know, about 90 feet to the aircraft's ground roll. Okay, so pressure altitude absolutely does affect aircraft performance. The question is why? Well, if you go back to thinking about that equation, what we know is pressure itself affects air density. As pressure goes up, air density goes up. So let's take a look at that and take a look at why that's happening. Okay, so this is a, a situa or an example of, of air molecules. And we're starting at 29.92. And if you look at it, we've got roughly an 80% mix of nitrogen, the gray molecules, and about a 20% mix of oxygen, um, the blue molecules. And as that pressure starts to increase, essentially, there's more and more force acting on the air, and it's squeezing it into a smaller and smaller area. So you can see here at 30.42, if we compare that to 29.92, you've got significantly more air. And that's really what it comes down to. When you try to understand, okay, so why does pressure change my airplane's performance? Because we always think of density altitude, which is the final result. Well, pressure is basically compacting that air. It's, it's taking more and more mass and pushing it into the same amount of volume. And so the air becomes more and more dense. Okay, so essentially, this is something that I think is very difficult. You can explain it all, but it can be kind of hard to just simply identify it. And that is, the airplane, it actually will feel like it's at a lower altitude. So as you look at that sea level pressure increasing a half inch above standard, the airplane feels like it's 500 feet lower. So you probably have heard of the term um, 
low to high, you're in the sky. Uh, IFR pilots use that every once in a while. Um, and it's because, you know, we're setting our altimeter settings periodically as we're flying through the air. Um, you don't set it constantly. So basically, it's only accurate if you're exactly where it was measured at exactly the time that it was measured. And so the, the pressure is always changing, which is one of the reasons why you would really never use your altimeter for like near ground collision avoidance, because it's not going to be that accurate. But let's take a look at that low to high, uh, you're in the sky and understand where that comes from. We're going to go back to the pressure view here. So take a look at what's happening. We're starting at 29.94, and the pressure is going to go high, so low to high. And we say the term, you're in the sky, because our altimeter is indicating lower than it actually is. We're still sitting here at sea level. And as we adjust the Colesman knob back to the current pressure, you saw that altimeter basically wind back up. So what you can see is low to high, we're in the sky. What it means is that your altimeter is going to indicate lower than you actually are. And so if someone says, what's going to happen? If you grab, this is a classic instrument instructing, instructor question. If you grab the altimeter knob and spin it up from 2992 to a higher pressure, what's going to happen? Your altitude is going to increase because it was showing essentially too low. Okay. We've got a question. Okay, David's got a timely question here, and that is, why doesn't the pressure knob set itself, and are there any self-adjusting options for altimeters? That's my job, and I have few jobs flying an autopilot-equipped airplane and cruise, so please do not take the job of adjusting the altimeter setting away from me. Um, it's a great question as to why you can't you know, automate it, but the reality is there's actually quite a few reasons why, why we wouldn't know. There's no way to transmit it to the airplane right now. The other thing is when you're dealing with a center controller, like on an IFR flight, they're going to tell me the altimeter setting that they want me to use because they're going to make sure that I'm above all of the terrain okay, or my minimum in-road altitudes will. But they also want to make sure all of the airplanes in their sector, especially on an IFR flight plan, are using or in that area are using the same altimeter setting. Because if we're all using different altimeter settings, we might read the same altitude, but we're not gonna be at the same altitude. And so that gets even more important as you go into class A airspace. So we talked about pressure altitude. Essentially, you can also find it by just dialing 29.92 on your altimeter. If you set 29.92, your altimeter will show you pressure altitude. And we use that inside class A airspace. We're in the flight level. So as we climb through 18,000 feet, we punch the barometric knob. It sets it to standard pressure, um, 29.92. And then we're no longer flying at a constant altitude. We're flying at a constant isobar. And we're slowly climbing or descending with the pressure systems. So again, you know, in fact, if you've done a lot of long cross-country flying, especially in the IFR world, sometimes I feel like below the flight levels. On a good day, my only job is updating altimeter settings until I get closer to my destination. Unfortunately, there's no way to automate that yet. Okay, next question. Okay, good follow-up question here, and this comes from Michael. Uh, he says, when you're flying a cross-country VFR, about how often or how far should you try to tune a local weather station for an updated altimeter setting? Okay, um, I'm gonna pull this off the top of my head because I keep it really, really close. Um, Colin, it's within 100 miles, right? Uh, yeah. Yep, legally within 100 nautical miles. Um, but that's pretty far away, and part of that is because you might be somewhere where you don't have uh, weather or pressure stations. There's a couple things that I know. Number one, there's certain things that are going to cause the pressure to change. Um, crossing a front or crossing mountain ranges or hills will cause your pressure to change rapidly. In fact, the five to 10 miles that it takes me to get from Boulder to the opposite side of the front range can raise my pressure by more than an inch. And so I'm gonna set my pressure uh, altimeter setting under VFR basically every time I pass a major airport. ADSB is becoming more and more common. If you have a Stratus and a Foreflight um, or any of the, the plug-in options to Foreflight or a Garmin, you can pull up those METARs. And honestly, these days, that's what I do. Um, I don't typically use the um, AWOS or ATIS at airports, uh, what I'll do is I'll scroll my airplane over, or scroll my pointer over a flag and take a look at the METAR uh, and make sure it's recent 
basically within an hour to a close airport under VFR, and then I'll set my pressure to that. That's kind of the way I roll. And I'll typically do that as I pass by any airport. Um, you know, especially in a VFR flight, it gives you something to do. Um, but you've got a lot of latitude, 100 miles. That being said, again, as I said, if you're crossing, you know, anything major, front, mountain range, uh, large set of hills, anything like that can change pressure. If you notice the weather changes below you, you go from calm winds to gusty winds, chances are the pressure's changed and I would quickly reset the altimeter too. Okay, um, so let's take a look at the opposite here. We looked at essentially low to high. So let's take a look at high to low and we're gonna take a look at another pressure system. And here we are, you can see this high pressure is moving out of the area. We started again at 29.92, just as kind of a reference point. We've got a low pressure system moving into the area. So you can see our pressure's unwinding. It's getting lower, and in this case, it's gonna drop about a half an inch. Okay, so let's take a look at that in our profile view. So what you could see, we started at 29.92. High pressure's exiting, low pressure's coming in. As I said, we're gonna get to about 29.42. Watch what's happening to the altimeter. We're not changing the Colesman window. We're leaving that right where it is. So watch what happens to the altimeter as that pressure changes. it thinks we're higher. And I'll go back. As we readjust the Colesman window, which was set at 29.92, as we wind that down to 29.42, you can see the altimeter drops. So a typical saying you'll hear people say, especially in instrument training, high to low, look out below. What that means is when high, when pressure drops, when it goes from what you've got in your altimeter to something lower, your altimeter is actually going to indicate higher than you really are. So if we go back to this animation, you can see that that pressure altitude essentially put us about five, exactly 500 feet high. But we know the airport is actually at sea level. So because the pressure has dropped by a half an inch, you take 29.92 minus 29.42, you get 0.5. You multiply that times 1,000, that gives you 500, and you add that to your station elevation. Our pressure altitude is now 500 feet. The altimeter thinks we're 500 feet high, though we're actually at sea level. And as we wind that Colesman window, what you'll find As we drop the Colesman window towards lower pressure, the altimeter unwinds or it basically glows down back to sea level. Okay, so let's take a look at how this affects our performance. If you take a look at these molecules, we've got our standard mix again. We've got 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Watch what happens as the pressure starts to decrease. Essentially, the molecules can now start to expand out. We have less mass in the same volume. And so because of that, the air is less dense. And you can take that all the way to the point where if you look at the airplane, what's happening as the pressure decreases, the airplane kind of feels like it's flying higher. Okay, so all of that you know, hopefully makes sense now that, that ultimately air pressure is packing more or less air into the same volume. As pressure decreases, there's less air in that volume, there's less density, the aircraft performance starts to drop. As pressure increases, there's more air in that volume and aircraft, and aircraft performance starts to increase. So the other side of this is density altitude. And density altitude is taking your pressure altitude and then correcting that for non-standard temperature. And by non-standard temperature, we assume essentially ISA, which is 15 degrees at the surface, and then that's gonna drop two degrees per thousand feet as we go up degrees Celsius. 
So that's our standard temperature, and it's just a middle value. It's, it's not based off of studies in an airport. Your airport may never be close to standard temperature, but it just gives us a baseline for performance comp uh, computation. So what happens is as temperature goes up, well, let's take a look at the equation. So as temperature goes up, it's inversely proportional to density. So as temperature goes up, air density goes down. And the question is why? If we take a look at that in the video, let's take a look. We're starting here at freezing, zero Celsius. And what you can see, notice the speed of the molecules. They're moving faster. And as we get up to about 45, 50, they're moving much further apart. And essentially, as we add heat to a gas, we're adding energy. And that causes the molecules to bounce around faster and move farther. And as they do that, they start to spread out and push back out. So increasing pressure is gonna jam more mass into a volume. But as you start to heat it out, uh, heat it up, it adds energy to those air molecules. And then they start to expand out again on their own. So temperature, it's got its own adverse effect. Okay, we got a question. Okay, Art's got a question with DA, uh, and he said, uh, how would you plan to arrive into an airport with an extremely high DA? Let's say Lake Tahoe, which six, sits at about 6,000 feet. Uh, on a hot summer day, the DA could be up to 13,000 feet. Okay, um, we see that a lot. Uh, we see that in Telluride, in Steamboat, even in Denver. Uh, density altitude, it, it really can be an effect. And um, one of the things that I always tell people is it on landing, it's going to have a little bit less of an effect uh, than it will on a go around or on takeoff. And so when I'm landing at a high density altitude airport, first of all, one of the things that I looked at is, or I'll look at is my bulk landing climb gradient and my in route and, and uh, takeoff climb gradients. Because even though I, I don't plan on using them, if I end up having to do uh, a misapproach or a go around, all of a sudden I'm gonna notice that decrease or that increased DA, that decreased air density. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll look and I'll see essentially at my standard landing configuration, what my go around performance is gonna be. And then typically if it's really high and my, my, I don't have a lot of performance to go around, they end up with a low climb rate. One of the things that I'll do is I'll land with partial flaps. Flaps add drag and we climb based off of excess thrust or excess power, essentially excess energy. Drag is what's combating that. So anything you can do to decrease drag or weight going into a high DA airport will help as you go around. Um, so one of those things could be landing with partial flaps or no flaps. Now keep in mind, you're gonna have a much longer ground roll, but many airports have runways, especially for light single engine airplanes or light twins that are long enough that you can absorb that extra ground roll. And that's a great reason why it's important to practice partial flap and no flap landings, because there's times that you could end up with a significantly increased you know, climb rate um, at high DAs. Another thing I'll do is I'll think about how much I'm fueling that airplane to. Um, you don't wanna necessarily land heavy. Um, you know, typically in the Cirrus, we like to load it up to maximum gross weight, but I like to carry as much fuel as I can. But if I know I'm going to be performance limited, I'll bring that fuel load back and I'll keep a close alternate in mind. Now that might even mean an extra fuel stop on my way into the airport uh, to make sure that I've got enough fuel, that I've got some alternates, but not so much fuel that my performance is, is limited. And then one of the biggest things is planning your departure. Uh, we've seen this in the mountains uh, more often than you'd think, and it's people who decide they're gonna leave Telluride in the afternoon. It takes a long time for a mountain airport to cool off, and usually by the time it does, it's dark, which is not a great time for a VFR departure. So, you know, while a daytime landing might be okay, uh, as long as you can make your, your go around or missed approach climb gradients, daytime takeoff can be a lot more difficult. Okay, we got another question. Okay, so Austin wants to know if you can show us an example of getting takeoff or landing distance uh, at a pressure altitude corrected for temperature in the Cirrus SR22. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna pull out a calculator here too. Um, let me clear this out. 
So takeoff distance, this is what we've got right here. In the Cirrus, they give you two options, weight at 3,600 pounds and weight at 29, uh, which is, oops, sorry, which is not your lowest weight um, because I don't even think our aircraft could ever get that low. I'll show you the other page, give me one second. Uh, it does not, well, it doesn't want to stop drawing and switch pages, so let me clear that out. Let's just take a look at this one right now. Okay, so when we're looking at the SR-22, let's take a look at the conditions at the top. So there's a couple uh, conditions that they're going to put up there. We got weight at 3,600 pounds, approximate speed at liftoff is 80 knots, Fe uh, speed over a 50-foot obstacle is 85 knots. In this computation, we're using flaps 50. Uh, that's the only flap sitting that Cirrus advises for takeoff. Power is full throttle mixture set. Runway is dry, dry paved, and level. If we come over to this side, we'll subtract 10% for each 12 knots and add 10% for each, or 12 knots of headwind and add 10% for each two knots of tailwind up to 10 knots. It's not that above 10 knots you'd have to add different numbers. It's that the aircraft would be difficult to control and they don't advise you landing the airplane with more than 10 knots of tailwind. And then we've got dry grass and runway slope. Um, and air conditioner. Uh, adds 100 feet to the ground roll and 150 feet to our distance over 50 foot. Okay, so knowing that, let's actually take a look. Um, let's take a look at, I'm going to open up a scratch pad. Let's take a look at Rocky Mountain Metro. So let's go into a map. Rocky Mountain Metro, our field elevation is 5,000 673. Sorry. And let's take a look at the weather today. So if we take a look at the METAR right now, it's eight miles overcast 800, altimeter is 29.91. So wow, it actually is standard today. Let's cheat on that just a little bit and say it's lower. That way we've got something to work with. Um, let's say the altimeter is, is 28.56. Okay, so the first thing that we'll wanna do is, let me see if I can pull up a calculator. That way you can watch me work. Okay, so we're gonna take 29.92 minus 28.56. That's 1.36. And you'll multiply that times 1,000. So we're 1,360 feet higher than the airport elevation. And we said the airport elevation is 56.73. So today, our pressure altitude, or, or with that simulated pressure, our pressure altitude will be 7,033 feet. And for the eclectic simplicity, I would just say 7,000 feet because it's going to be close enough. Okay, so let's go back to four flight. Our PA is 7033, which is about 7,000 feet. And the temperature today, uh, if we take a look at the temperature, is three. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so we're gonna start with the pressure altitude of 7,000 feet. We're gonna look at a temperature of three degrees. And if we go to our documents, we'll scroll down to 7,000 feet. Okay, and now we need to find three degrees. So that's gonna be in between zero and 10. So we're using these two right here. And the way we want to do this is essentially we're going to take 2322 minus 2149. So let's do that. That gives us 173. And we'll go back to four flight. 
So there's 173 feet of difference, and it's between a temperature of 0 and 10, so 30%. So times 0.3. Fifty one point nine or fifty two feet. Okay, so if we go back to four flight, you're going to add the fifty two feet to twenty one point forty nine. So essentially, twenty two oh one. That is our ground roll, and then we would do the exact same thing for our 50 foot obstacle. And one of the troublesome things with aircraft performance, um, I always tell people is that not only do you need to know your takeoff distance and your ground roll and your landing distance and your ground roll, but there's quite a few times that we also wanna know um, our performance over uh, our, our takeoff bulk landing climb gradient, our climb performance at VY with flaps 50 and our climb performance with flaps up. If you're an instrument rated pilot, those numbers can be very important, not always for your departure airport, but for your destination. Because if you're shooting an instrument approach, uh, oftentimes, especially in mountainous or terrain limited areas or areas with obstacles like towers, you can end up with increased climb gradients. So going through that process of computing the numbers, um, it can be really important. That being said, uh, those tables can be really time consuming. And if you're training, it's something you absolutely want to be able to do. You should always know how to go back to it. Uh, we have an app that we use um, that, that we built just for our Cirrus that tracks uh, the maintenance and stuff like that. You can get apps for your airplane that will track the performance. One of the things I always tell people uh, when you download an app for performance on your airplane uh, that'll give you the performance numbers, it's not certified. It's your responsibility to make sure it's accurate. So one of the things that I'll do if I find an app that computes my airplane's performance is I'll actually then go into the tables and do several test computations to make sure that the app actually computes accurately because um, you never know, the developer could be wrong. Okay, we've got another question. Okay, next question. Michael wants to know, what's the best technique for leaning the mix mixture at a high DA airport before takeoff? Okay, so this all depends um, when you start to lean all depends a little bit on manufacturer. And it can also change by the engine type and the carburetor installation and, and fuel injector installation. So you wanna take a look at your POH for your takeoff performance and see if they give you advice. I would say one of the most common things that you'll see in a normally aspirated airplane, excuse me, which means non-turbocharged or turbo-normalized, but just it's breathing the air normally, it doesn't have any help. Uh, typically you'll see that you'll start to lean once you're above 3000 feet. And they don't specify PA or DA. The reality is the engine doesn't care what your actual altitude is. It's really 3,000 feet density altitude. So if you're sitting at like 2,000 feet on a really hot day with low pressure, you may still want to lean the airplane. And then how you do it depends on whether you're fixed pitch or whether you've got um, a constant speed propeller. Uh, and the, the simplest ways I can say right now with a fixed pitch propeller is you're essentially going to bring that airplane up to, you know, your run-up RPM. Uh, where you're generating you know, maybe 1,700 RPM or whatever your run-up RPM is in your airplane. Or in some cases, it may even help to bring it up to full power. You know, hold the brakes. You're going to start with that mixture full rich or fairly rich. In a fixed pitch uh, engine, you're going to move that mixture control back slowly, giving the engine time to adjust. So you're not sweeping it back. You're just kind of pulling it back slowly. And you're going to see the RPM start to rise. And if you're doing it too quickly, you're not giving a chance for the engine to react. So you just want to slowly milk that mixture control back or twist it back if you're in a Cessna. Once the RPMs peak out and start to drop, that's where you're at that perfect stoichiometric mixture. You're burning as much fuel as you can and leaning it out is actually taking fuel away from the engine and it's going to start to degrease in power. So that's how I would lean in a fixed pitch airplane. In a constant speed airplane, you can look, use your uh, manifold pressure. Essentially, same thing, you're going to see your manifold pressure rise, your, your RPMs uh, may stay steady, but your manifold pressure will rise and then it will start to drop once you get past that peak. Um, in some aircraft, you can also use the EGTs, though honestly, I find either using the um, fixed pitch, the RPM, or uh, in an airplane that's 
that's uh, constant speed prop using looking for a drop in manifold pressure. That's the easiest. When people say they're struggling with it, when people from low DA airports come up to Colorado and they're really having a hard time getting the, leaned out, uh, the airplane leaned out, one of the things I often find is that the airplane may not be at enough power. Um, so you wanna make sure you're high power. And then the other thing is that they're leaning too quickly. It takes time for that engine to stabilize with the mixture. You wanna take time pulling it back. You know, one, two, three, four, just slowly let that engine kind of get up to power. If you're in a turbo normalized or turbocharged airplane, like our Cirrus, we will typically lean the mixture for a taxi because that turbocharger hasn't fully kicked in yet. And if we leave it rich, it'll start to foul our spark plugs. But once we go for takeoff, the manufacturer wants us at full rich. And that's because at takeoff, we're at full power and the turbo normalizer or the turbocharger is basically keeping the airplane at sea level. So even though we're at six, seven, eight, eleven thousand 11,000 feet density altitude, the engine cylinders still think they're at sea level. In fact, in a turbocharged airplane uh, like ours, we're at 36 and a half inches. So we're even, they feel below sea level. Okay, we got another question. Okay, so Ivan wants to know, why do we reset the altimeter at 2.9 or 9 or 2 when we're going through flight level 180? And what if 2.9 or 9 or 2 puts you pressure corrected altitude below 18,000 feet and you're flying at flight level 180? Great question. So there's a couple answers. Number one, once you get into Class A airspace in the United States, uh, that's when you're going to transition to 2.9 or 0.9 or 2 pressure altitude. And that's used so that all aircraft, no matter what, where they are in the United States, as they move through different areas, as long as they're staying at their assigned altitude, they're never going to conflict with anybody. When we're below Class A airspace, you have airplanes that are under ATC control and airplanes that aren't. They could all be on different altimeter settings. Uh, and so even though they could all be indicating the same altitude, they're all at different altitudes. Once you get up in Class A airspace, everybody's under ATC control. And they're moving very, very quickly, typically, especially, you know, a transport category aircraft. And so it's just easier. You don't have to worry about how high you are above the ground. You're well above the terrain. It's easier to keep them all at 29.92. They're not staying at a constant altitude. They're staying at a constant flight level. And a flight level isn't an altitude. It's essentially riding a line of constant pressure. The airplane will descend or descend and climb as it moves along that pressure. So as you go into a, a low pressure area, you may find the airplane starts to descend as it moves into high pressure, it'll start to climb a little bit. You won't notice it because this happens so gradually, but everybody's sitting there uh, at 29.92. And in fact, if you take a look at a Jepson chart, I'll pop one up really quickly here. Uh, you'll notice that they actually list uh, the transition altitude and flight level and what they basically tell you right here um, is where you're going to transition from a local altimeter setting to 29.92. There was a second part to that question that I forgot. What was it, Colin? And that was what happens if uh, your altimeter setting, or 299 or 2, puts you below 18,000 MSF. Great. Okay, so there's always a lowest usable flight level. And this depends by country, okay? Uh, in, in some countries, this, the, the, that transition altitude can happen as low as 4,000 feet. In the United States, it's 18,000 feet. Um, so at 18,000 feet, that's when the flight levels start. But that does not always mean that flight level 180 is available. It depends on the station pressure in the area. So let's take a look at a scratch pad. Uh, I'm going to just grab a new one. Okay, so if you think about it, uh, the pressure rides kind of like ridges. And if we have high pressure here and low pressure here, what's gonna happen is it goes up, right? So these are the pressure lines right here. Okay, so let's say this is pressure altitude of 18,000 feet. And that line is 18,000 feet MSL. This is actually what's happening in the atmosphere. At this point, back here, you can see our pressure altitude of 18,000 feet is actually below 18,000 feet MSL. So flight level 180 would not be usable. ATC can't assign that flight level. And as we get into this area, which would be higher than standard pressure. The standard's 29.92. Once you get into higher, the stand, higher than standard pressure, all of a sudden flight level 180 
climbs above 18,000 feet MSL. And now flight level 180 is considered a usable flight level. So when you're on an IFR cross country um, at a low flight level, 18,000, 19,000, uh, or flight level 180 or 190, you may find that ATC actually has to climb you to a higher flight level because you're entering an area of lower pressure and your flight level is going to descend below 18,000 feet MSL. So if, if you're ever in an area where it takes you below that 18,000 feet MSL altitude, ATC is gonna put you at a higher flight level or they're gonna switch you back to a local altimeter setting and have you maintain 17,000 feet or 16,000 feet. Okay, we got another question. Okay, we got time for this last question here and it comes from Yannick. He wants to know if the airport ASOS is unavailable for us to get the current altimeter, what should we do? Okay, so there's, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, first of all, if you can't get ASOS, you can always set your altimeter to the airport's field elevation. In fact, that's gonna give you basically the most accurate altimeter setting if you dial it right to the field elevation, or even better, if you look at the runway's elevation on an airport chart when you're on the runway, because you'll notice that the field elevation is the highest point on usable runways. Uh, the touchdown zone elevation is the highest point in the first 3,000 feet of the runway. So if you're at, on, the, you know, on the numbers ready to part and you set the runway's elevation, that'll be the most accurate. So that's what you can do, you know, right there, easy, you don't have to do anything else uh, if you can't get ASOS. The other thing you can do is you could set it to an airport uh, that's reporting um, in the area. And you'll see that typically on instrument arrivals. Um, let me see, I don't know if Devil's Lake uses that, let me see. Um, there we go, okay, so let me clear this. So take a look at this note. It says, use local altimeter setting. If not received, use the can-do altimeter setting. And then oftentimes what you'll notice, because they know that that's no longer accurate, um, they'll actually raise the minimums if you're using another airport's altimeter setting. But VFR on takeoff, I'd simply, if you don't have ASOS, just set that altimeter to indicate field or runway elevation and you're ready to go. Okay, that's all the time we've got tonight. Um, I got three links to brief you on here at the end. Um, if you take a look at the description, our top link links to our training courses. Uh, we talk a lot about density altitude and its effect on takeoff and landing and sloped runways. We use Aspen and, and Telluride as examples uh, in our takeoffs and landings course. So if you've never taken a look at that course, especially as you get into summer and you wanna start thinking about, okay, so how's that gonna affect my airplane? What techniques should I use? That's a great course to take a look at. And it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if it doesn't work out for you, you can always return it, uh, no questions asked. The second link is a link to our next presentation. That's Holding Patterns Part 2 tonight. Uh, last time we talked about holding pattern entries. Tonight we're going to talk about timing and wind correction inside a holding pattern. And we're going to take a look at you know, what would happen if you correct improperly and how to calculate those corrections accurately as you're going through a holding pattern. And then finally, our third link takes you to some comments where you can tell us uh, what you thought of this presentation and give us ideas for the next VFR presentation, which will be in two weeks from now. And we hope to see you then. Thanks for tuning in and have a great night.